what a what a wonderful Sunday when uh, one of those rare uh, Sundays when we just have the privilege of um, living out the two ordinances that uh, Jesus asked us to live out baptism and in a few minutes we'll enjoy communion together what a privilege to uh, to be able to do that uh, for Christ this morning and um, what a joy to see each of you here. <clears throat> Let me share a few things before we have communion this morning. We're going to be in Mark uh, chapter 4, the first uh, eight or nine verses, a very familiar parable of Jesus that we'll read in just a minute. But first, uh, introduce that. Uh, the message title today, if you looked at the other services, is Four Men in a Pew, Which One Are You? Four Men in a Pew, Which One Are You? I wish you all every now and then could have the choir's view or the praise team's view or Willard and I's view of you on a Sunday morning and uh, just to observe the different activities that go on in the pews during a worship service. It's um, um, over the years, it's pretty amazing. I there's more. I, I thought of four categories that sometimes I see. First of all, there are who I call the nodders. The, 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 the nodders. And these are people in the pews who just always seem to leave more refreshed than the rest of us <laughs> after a preaching service. And uh, I always tell, don't worry about it. You know, you must have, God knew you needed your rest, and so he brought you to hear my message today. Uh, uh, a second group, I, I always call them, they're kind of the time management specialist. Uh, they are great at occasionally, you'll see them looking at their watches, especially during the sermon, or uh, every now and then they'll, you'll see them pick up their iPhone and and uh, check out what time it is or how long the message is going. Um, and you don't hear it quite as much as you used to, but you used to always hear around the top of the hour alarms going off. You'd hear nice little beeps and, and uh, creative alarms. You know, with cell phones, you don't hear that quite as much. Uh, maybe you'll hear somebody getting a phone call with an interesting... Just be careful what your phone what your phone ring is, if you've got some kind of a song, that can kind of be embarrassing as well. Uh, a third group I always called the candy pushers. And um, they're the ones who try to quietly open and distribute things like gum, lifesavers, uh, those little red and white mints that you think are quiet when you twirl the plastic open and try to get it out of there, um, and they try to do this while not disturbing anyone else around them, um, and they don't disturb me, but we do hear it and see that, um, and finally, I always call them the CIA, FBI correspondents, and these are usually a younger generation, but I have seen adults that do it too. Uh, they've think they've learned to communicate secretly during preaching by writing an important note or two on the bulletin or on a piece of paper and they try to pass it around to each other. Sometimes they'll make a mistake and you'll hear a giggle about what they're writing. Or what's interesting on Monday or Tuesday is kind of going through the pews and, and seeing people that have left their notes and not taken them home. And um, I never think that I look like that or sound like that, but I, I, don't, uh, I don't take any offense. Or that I know most, pe most uh, teenagers' uh, current dating situations a lot of times by just reading those notes on Monday or Tuesday. So, you know, you do observe a lot of, of different ways that people gather in and worship and hear the Word of God. Now, just as I observe different activities in the pews on a Sunday morning, Jesus observed that people listen to and hear the Word of God in different ways. 
Uh, and it's interesting that as you read all of the Gospels in, in a big picture, I don't remember Jesus giving any or not, or, or, or if he did, one or two lessons on how to teach or how to preach. Now, most uh, preachers would have loved for him to have given some one, two, three, fours on how to preach. That would have been wonderful, or how to teach, because he's the greatest teacher and preacher that's ever lived. But Jesus, on the other side, gave a lot of lessons, gave a lot of teaching and parables on how that we need to listen to God's Word how to concentrate and meditate and take God's word in. He said a lot on how to hear, didn't he? And many times, especially at the end of this parable, he'd say, he who has ears, let him hear. So in the parable of the sower, Jesus gives us four ways in which most people hear and receive the word of God when it's proclaimed or when it's taught or when you read it. So of these four men in a pew, which one are you? Here's the parable from the fourth chapter of Mark. And we'll read the first uh, nine verses. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were among on the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Jesus said there's many ways of hearing God's word. The first way of hearing God's word is what I call the people that hear no God, see no God, speak no God. Think of the statue of the three monkeys, right? Remember the monkeys, the, the, the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. They've got their eyes covered over the different parts of their body. And the first type of hearer that Jesus describes is what he says is like seed that a, a farmer would sow and it, and it falls on a hard path. Now, as the Palestinian farmer uh, set out his rows and his plants and his crops, he left rows between the crops and they became very hard because uh, not only did, did he and the farmers use it to go through and weed and, and to reap the, uh, the crop, but it was also the highway and the byway of everybody. If you're going from town to town, house to house, village to village, you know, it was, you didn't have fences. It was perfectly okay to walk between the crops that a farmer had put out. So they became very hard, very compact. And um, so the chance of a, of a seed getting into that soil underneath the hard pan was very rare. And you know, some people's hearts are that way when it comes to listening to God's Word, isn't it? For whatever reason, they hear the Word, they hear the Gospel preached, they hear the Christian truth, but it never finds entry into their hearts and into their life so that it can grow. It, it just never, uh, never produces anything. And why is this? Well, oftentimes for many people, it's a due to things like a lack of interest. Uh, people in, in our culture today, some just have no interest in the things of God. Or the things of God and what God wants to say to us are just pushed aside, marginalized, or compartmentalized 
uh, like everything else in life. I have, I have uh, my job, I have my children, uh, I have my school activities, I have my sports, I have my interests, I have my travel, and also have church. I do that on Sunday every now and then. We compartmentalize God's Word. Maybe it's just an indifference or not caring, or, or maybe they think that, that God's Word is just irrelevant to life and they can get along without it. In today's world, we have a new category of religious survey when people ask, what is your faith? And the way people respond and they check, they just have no faith. They check none, N-O-N-E, and we call them the nuns. And, and many of, of the folk that check that nun box are men and women who have grown up in church. I've met a lot of them recently and talking to them and sharing my faith and asking them where their faith is. And a lot of the stories I get today is, you know, I, I went to, one guy was telling me, man, when I was a kid, I went to school seven days, I went to church seven days a week, every day. Mike, you'll love this. They, they, a couple of them would say, I went to Catholic school, and, uh, and man, I had either sisters or I had brothers that were my instructors, and man, they were tough, and, and it was a disciplinary environment, and I just got churched out. And as life went on, and as they grew and, and got married and had families, uh, they just, you know, church just is not a part of their life anymore. They hear God's word. They know God's word. It just falls on deaf ears. Now, these reasons and just letting God's word fall on a hard path um, might be valid, except life is not that easy. And life without God has consequences. And in life, there is, no matter if you believe in God or not, there's sin, there's pain, there's suffering, there's hardship, there's death, whether we want to admit it or not. And at some point, I pray that everybody, even these folk whose, whose hearts have become very hard to God's word, will realize that there is a power greater than our own, and his name is Jesus. And the tragedy of life is that many discover this too late, and they never know the joy, and they, they never know the great adventure. They never realize what they've been created for for all their years. And it's, it's sad. So are you like the seed? Are you like the path? God's word's fallen on you many times and it's just hard. It never gets through. Now the next group of, of folk are I call the Sunday Christians. Um, they are like the seeds that fall into the rocky ground. Now the rocky soil was not, don't imagine ground is filled with rocks. That sometimes we have that where we try to plant a garden, you know, you got to move all these pebbles and rocks and is there any dirt down there? But really what was happening in Palestine is there's this thin layer of limestone just beneath the surface of the soil. And the, the seeds would go in, they would sprout, but the roots could never get deep enough. And so when that hot arid sun came out, you just couldn't keep it watered enough, and the roots would be scorched very quickly, and the plants would die. And some people, Jesus says, are like this when they hear God's word. They hear the wonderful message of Christ. They're swept off their feet in a wave of emotion. But the problem is, is that no person can live only on emotion all the time. Because Christianity has its demands that must be dealt with and faced. And there's a definite commitment to being a follower of Jesus Christ. Baptism, a person says, Tony says today, I'm going to make that commitment. There's a commitment to following Jesus. Our faith must have substance. It, it must have intelligence. Uh, Paul would later say to Timothy, study the word to show thyself approved unto God. 
You see, bubbling emotional enthusiasm is a far cry from the deep-rooted joy that comes from knowing Jesus. Jesus needs to go deep. It's like the parable of the hidden treasure that Jesus told in Matthew. The man finds there's treasure hidden in a field, and he sells everything in order to buy it. Because, you know, finding Jesus, the treasure is we'll do anything, we'll get rid of anything, because we've discovered the deep joy there is in following Christ. And this also speaks to the hearer that, the, the hearer that begins something but never finishes it. I am famous for starting projects and never finishing them. Tammy, am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, boy, uh, boy, I just put her in a bad mood for the rest of the day. But you know, you start a project around the house or, or you say, I'm going to get that and you get a good start to it and, uh, and it just lays there for months, you know, and it never gets finished. And you know, probably because I've got a lot of adult ADHD in me, and that probably um, uh, helps with that. But some people um, get excited at first about the Lord and Christianity, and, and, uh, but they just forget to give it all of their life and all of their years to the Lord. The roots don't go deep enough, and sometimes they move on to something else pretty quickly. What Jesus was talking about. The third kind is the strangled Christian. It's the hearer of Jesus' words, and it's like the seed that falls among the thorns. Now, the Palestinian farmer, I guess maybe they didn't know any better, but when he went to weed, a lot of times he would just go and cut off the tops of the weeds down to the ground and try to get the weeds out. A lot of them just wouldn't pull them up by the roots, and, and so obviously the, the, the weeds would begin to grow again, and they'd even grow uh, quicker and, and more dense, and they'd begin to take over the garden if he wasn't careful. Jesus says that, that, that that's a lot of us who listen to the Word of God, and, and, um, and then we, we kind of don't forget about it, but... We don't believe in it enough. Our faith is not strong enough. We, we don't, you know, by faith just say this is 100% the word of God. This is the way I need to live. And when that happens, it's so easy for the outside cares of the world to come in and choke the life out of a Christian. We begin to worry about things without including Christ about our relationships or about our work or about our finances or, or about um, other issues that we're having in life. And, and pretty soon these worries, these anxieties, the, these problems take over our life instead of asking Christ to come in and help us with this and let him walk alongside of us. In other words, it's not making Jesus first. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added, into, added unto you. The modern world can become very busy, can it? It can become very crowded. It's very fast-paced. And pretty soon, we, we don't realize it happening. It, it happens very slowly, incrementally, and, and all of a sudden we wake up one day and we've, we've discovered we've become too busy to pray. We've become too preoccupied with other things to study God's Word. Or we've, we've become so involved with committees and good works and working for the church, we've left no time to, to spend time just with Jesus. William Barclay once said, it's, it's not the things which are obviously bad that are dangerous. It's the things which are good. For the second best is always the worst enemy of the best. Jesus wants us to have the best, but he wants us to give him the best. And then, of course, finally, there's the fruitful hearer. The, um, the one whose seed falls in fertile ground and the uh, the roots go deep. It produces a beautiful crop. Um, I've got one crop this year. It's one little cherry tomato plant in a pot. But, boy, I'm waiting for that to really fill out and, 
and have some good sweet cherry tomatoes. And I really took care of the soil and all. Well, Tammy did. I, I started to plant it, but I quit. <laughs> but as the, you know, as the sower plants, um, uh, you know, it just, the word just finds this beautiful soil and it begins to bear fruit. And, and it just says that some people will hear the word of God and, and they'll receive it and they'll take it deep into themselves. And, and God's word begins to control their, their emotions and their mind and their body and, and their personalities, their outlook on life and, and the way they inter, interact with people just bears fruit for Jesus Christ. And the people around them are drawn to a relationship with Christ. And that's why Jesus came, isn't it? He wants us to hear his word and believe in him and have that kind of life for him. Well, there's four men in a pew. Which one are you? you the one that hears God's word and ignores it? To hear no God, see no God, speak no God? Are you the, the person who refuses to take it seriously? You hear God's word. It, you, you love coming and get the emotion of the praise band and singing. But after that, you go about life. Are you the one that lets the problems of the world stamp God's word out? Or are you the one that really desires and, and wants to hear it and obey it and live it and live the powerful life that, that those who let God's word go deep within them have? That's what God challenges us with this morning. Well, why can we... Um, how can we even hear God's word? How can we even understand it? Well, it's because um, of what Christ did for us, isn't it? Because he did uh, suffer for us. Because he did bleed for us. Because he did give his life for us on the cross. And I think that's uh, to remember the power we have because of Jesus in us. Jesus said... Um, I want you to remember often what I did for you, to keep that fresh, to, to keep that, those, those words of mine going deep. And, and he gives us communion. He gives us the bread, and he gives us the cup. And when he was in that upper room with the disciples that last night, he, in the midst of that supper, he, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, I want you to remember as you get together often that the breaking of the bread is is my body given for you, broken for you. I did this for you. And then at some point he took the cup and, and he passed the cup and, and as he prayed for the cup and as he shared with the disciples, he said, you know, this cup is the New Testament. It's a New Testament. I want you to remember that, a new covenant that's uh, it's in my blood, that's sacrificed for the forgiveness of sins of everyone. Paul thought it so important later on he would say, every time you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so we come today remembering Jesus gives us himself. He is the word. He is the word. We come today and take communion together to remember what Jesus did for us. So if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, in just a minute, the praise team comes. Are somebody going to play? Brad? Why we take communion? We have music. We have music. Music's going to play. We have two communion um, stations here. Uh, I'm going to ask um, a couple are going to come up and help Willard and I. We're going to have a prayer in a minute. But I invite you, if you know Christ, to come up and uh, receive and remember as you eat the bread that this is the body. This is my body which is given for you. As you drink from the cup, I uh, want you to, or you dip the bread and take it in, remember that this is my blood which is given for you. And let's remember together, that's communion, let's remember together what Jesus has done for us. And then we'll have a closing song. Let's pray as we get ready to enter into communion. Those that are helping, come on up. Lord Jesus, uh, thank you for giving your all uh, that we may live forever spiritually that we can have a wonderful life in 
um, as, as men and women that live out this life on earth, but we even have a greater place awaiting us. Lord, we know that it, um, it required grace. It required your life. And Lord, as we partake of the bread and the cup, may we remember once again this beautiful symbol you've given us and what you've done for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.